Good morning, everyone. I'm Jane Sartin, um, Executive Director of the Flexible Space Association, and welcome to the second in our series of Workspace Wisdom webinars. Um, I'm slightly regretting that title, it's quite, quite difficult to say. Um, and these are designed to give practical advice on, um, on running flexible workspaces to members of the Flexible Space Association. And I know that we're also joined by a number of guests this morning as well. Um, today, we have Zoe Ellis-Moore with us, who is the CEO and founder of Spaces to Places, to be talking about um, marketing strategies and plans. Um, as we go along, feel free to put questions into the chat box and I'll pick these up at the end with, with Zoe. And we've got um, a few questions that were submitted in advance as well. So we'll, we'll cover those at the end. So um, without further ado, I shall find Zoe's presentation and then um, leave her to present. Thank you very much for the introduction and lovely to see so many people here today. I think uh, there's quite a variety of different um, people from marketing backgrounds, some non-marketing backgrounds, larger providers, smaller providers. So we've got a great mix of people. So hence, it's going to be very much quite uh, top level going through all the details. What I'm really keen on at the moment is I think we've all been through a bumpy ride for the last two years. And hence, sometimes marketing planning has turned into much more reactive time. <laughs> So now I think we can really look ahead this year, and especially if you're coming up to a new financial year or anything, planning ahead is crucial, and that's where the marketing strategy and plan comes into place. Um, my big objective for today is to inspire. I think it's always great to learn from different operators, different providers, so hopefully you'll come away with some inspiration and be excited about creating plans. So that is my big objective there. What I'm going to do, um, so I've been given sort of 15 to 20 minutes sort of to go through the presentation and then with questions at the end. So the content of the presentation I'm just going to go through with yourself is really, first of all, giving a big picture. I think it's really important to have that big picture perspective before thinking about marketing strategy and plan. Then the second part always I want to give you some sort of overview on some tools and techniques and sort of for building that plan strategy and then finally very much some top tips some practical sort of guidance there and questions it's always going to be really helpful because i think we've got great people online today we can learn from each other as well so do put in questions and get involved so with no further ado i will go into the first slide here so approach this is sort of spaces to places signature approach and it's always going back to research first one of the crucial things is before you jump in and get really tactical with marketing or thinking about what you're going to be doing always look back and sort of what research if you have a portfolio or you've got one location really understanding the local dynamics is crucial understanding what's worked before what's your target client base you know, what's your tenants? What's their makeup? What are they looking for? What's demand? Has it gone much more towards um, the co-working? Has it gone to more larger office spaces? Looking what new competitions come about. Research will always give you a good foundation. So a good point to start with, first of all. And what we always do is look at research and the data, then find out if we need further information. So I would say before you even start thinking about planning is look at what data and information is available there on the sort of the very much what the situation is locally. We know the bigger picture on the industry and stuff. So bringing that in as well on the, it's a growth sector and the transition much more from conventional leases and big corporates coming over to flex as well. So bringing everything together there. The next part is always then about place making or what's the brand experience. So that encompasses all the things, elements that bring together um, what your brand's about. So what sort of customer touch points, what they see, the customer service, the interior design, what community it is. Is it more professional corporate end of the market for more introverts? Is it more about extroverts? And is it about sort of creative collaborative spaces? What is your makeup inside? Is it 
bigger, uh, larger um, sort of office occupiers, traditional office occupiers? Is it more the freelancer sort of vibe and network? So really understanding what your place and how that brand that you've created, um, placemaking, what we call sort of that placemaking is really thinking about the whole brand as a whole. So analysing um, your brand um, will really help as well with the marketing to make sure your product's right. So thinking about if there is any tweaks needed. So that's where we always look at what's the brand, what's the perception, sometimes just doing some simple surveys of uh, businesses that aren't your tenants, asking them what they think really gives you some great foundation with sort of really creating a great brand of solid foundation there. Finally, once you've got the research, the sort of the place making um, there in place, you can do marketing and the difference is you can do revenue generating marketing because you know who you're targeting, you know your product's right for that audience. That's the difference there. Often I get um, requests where people are like, oh, we need more technology. Actually, we can't just magically appear. Um, technology sort of clientele in the workspace. You need to know if um, the research is telling you that there's a demand locally, that there's businesses already out there, that technology companies needing workspaces. So it's always, um, I find some people have lots of hope marketing um, ideas and thoughts, and it's always making sure that you know your plans are realistic because they're based on information that you know locally, what type of business is there or what targets that you can go after. That's crucial with managing expectations. So that's generally a quick snapshot of our approach. But the other part before you go into the planning is really thinking of the business strategy. Um, because business strategy always implicates, it has implications for marketing strategy. One of the things I do sort of look at with businesses and the questions and sort of we're always trying to understand its basis places is the sort of objectives there. And is the business strategy very much short term and very much um, taking some examples of the opposite extremes, private equity is going to be much more short term. They're going to be looking for faster sort of turnaround of a uh, workspace. They're going to be a bit more sort of looking at the figures. A family owned business is going to be much more long term building that pipeline and very much knowing that business is going to be there for the long term. Um, some of these things change, but understanding the company structure and how it implements the business strategy is key. We've also got lots of different levels as well. We're going to focus on a um, bit with the planning much more on sort of the local, locational level marketing tactics that um, can come to play there. But uh, you need to consider the bigger corporate strategy. Is there sort of the corporate level? Maybe you're trying to raise um, some investment. Um, so you're going out with PR and stuff. That would be much more corporate level as the organisation as a whole. If you, you're a big sort of IWG, you'll have a corporate level with IWG and then separate brands and much more company level. So um, there's sometimes marketing strategies very much on that corporate level. And they're very different from um, very much the activation locally with local workspace. In the middle, um, quite a few of you might be in this sort of band. You've got much more of a company that you're sort of, you've got that company brand level that you're looking at. We've seen quite a few. I was thinking um, sort of Ariga have done a new brand and website. We've run away. This has also changed their brand and their target market and their website as well. Uh, Clockwise for new website. Quite a lot have been really looking at their company level and what that brand is across their portfolio. So that's more where you're looking at across the portfolio level of co um, company marketing. So it's calling up the local level, this is where we're sort of focused on one flexible workspace and the marketing activities there. So I think it's all setting that scene out first is crucial. Then with the strategies, um, that always links to goals. So you might have a growth strategy, you might be expanding loads of different new locations and sites, you might be going into new products, you might be venturing into say a part-time office product. So this is really growth. This is a strategy to sort of classify it. 
sometimes in the sort of theory book they call it much more of a defensive strategy but um you could be thinking about just retaining your current clientele you might be at 95 percent occupancy so you're very much about customer attention then it's a different type of strategy key factor and keeping that churn of new customers once you've got availability coming in is a different type of strategy you might be have low occupancy on the opposite history and you'd be much more like let's um we need to target new audiences. We need to bring in and secure new occupiers. So you've got much more of an acquisition strategy for your planning there um, and the implications. A lot at the moment with providers, what we found with COVID, um, customer expectations have changed. No longer is an office a commodity and must have, you know, every business thinking they need an office space. So with this change that we've seen with the last two years, um, customer expectations is so much more higher. And where we've all, I've mentioned quite a few rebranding and new websites and really getting much more uh, technology savvy to have that first impression online really strong is expectations, customer service, response rates is is much much higher now so sometimes um you might have a whole project quite a few clients we've been working in with have been about evolving and their strategy is about evolving making sure that they have a strong presence now in a post-covid world others um you might say your strategy is very much more um, competitive advantage whether that's technology, whether you want to be the destination or whether you're an ink hive and you're much more about a lost sort of cost. So tech space, which is a very niche offering for um, the sector. So competitive advantage is another sort of strategy. So these are a few bigger strategies that um, you can be thinking about implementing there. Now, I think if we think about some of the tools and techniques, um, I'm just going to go through the channels now. This is more, <laughs> there's lots of ways of cutting them up, but thinking crucially about channels. I do always go like that. You have loads of opportunities for marketing. You can do sometimes contra deals as well and utilising the space you have to make your marketing budget work harder. So events is always pre and sort of COVID been a great way to bring in new clientele. Signage is a key one. I think um, I've seen many times that people walk past some workspaces and think they're cafes or they're something else. They don't realize the offering inside. So this is where that first sort of customer interactions need to be strong explaining what's inside and what you're about. So always on-site marketing is a great channel to be thought of as well and sometimes often forgotten the whole sort of community management as well so sort of, there's lots of activities that you can do partnerships there um, really focusing on that word of mouth and that community engagement so just put them in here on this slide into different buckets crucially one to focus on um, that should be always be in a plan is your crm system and how you're nurturing leads how you're working with that database this can lead in then to sort of direct marketing if you've got that great foundation of a database where you've done the research and built out a database of targets you can be doing really great email marketing uh, that's highly effective lead generation marketing maybe uh, outreaches via linkedin as well um, door jobs um sometimes that works really well if you're a very local neighborhood that's i've seen some great results there so thinking about how you then with that sort of database crm approach actually do some really targeted direct marketing is a key um, another sort of bucket that i've put in there website is a core foundation it should be websites generally i see is about lead generation so looking at conversions there really optimizing making sure it's seo optimized and the user experience is strong there so website needs to appear as quite a, a fundamental one in the whole plan we can open up the whole with ads you know whole world with advertising ppc is a really good strong way um, that you've got people that are interested with the intention of purchasing or looking and investigating um, flexible office spaces especially if they're searching 
on the word offices co-working there. Um, so there's lots you can do now with digital um, display adverts and social adverts, but also clients are working with still sort of magazines. Um, there's a lifestyle magazine locally, advertising on radio. These ones do work. Traditional um, media does work and it's become a bit more cost effective in the post um, COVID world that we're finding some great opportunities locally. We'll bring on later about Google My Business, but really seeing the increase with Google My Business and the importance of that with search as well and searching on maps because it's the third largest sort of search now, people searching on maps. So we're finding um, ex increased exposure with Google My Business profiles there and really optimizing as well. Uh, Instagram's become much more stronger with local hashtags coming, you know, if you're focusing on a sort of local area of hashtag strategy, that's working really strong. And the final one I've got there, no, I'm going through it whistle top speed with everything here, is brokers. So um, I do see this as a marketing channel because the brokers need sort of relationship building, they need great content. And you need sort of hero, really strong images and copy as well to stand out, especially if you are in a, an area where there's quite a lot of competition. You want to stop people scrolling. So you've got to really work with marketing and have eye con catching content there. So I thought I would give you an example of sort of building out a sort of strategy there. I've been with these images that I put in thinking very much about a, a more um, local sort of neighbourhood workspace on a fringes of a, a city centre and how you would go about marketing. So with this example and some images I thought to give you a flavour, here it would be strategy would very much be a community first approach and really embedding grassroots activities into the local community. The activities for minimum wastage would be highly targeted um, for the highest conversion rates. Look, depending on um, what flexible office and where it is, this one I'm sort of suggesting you would look to a six, um, six minute drive time on how far people are willing to travel. There's always a connection um, with the distance that businesses are already located on how far you can pull them in as well. So that's why it's very much a targeted approach. For the larger demands, um, do say that to work with a broker and quite a few of the broker portals there, Flexa, Easy Offices, any of the, the big ones there, because they will bring in leads um, as well, that you need those larger leads because your local targeted marketing activity will focus on the local pipeline that's crucial there for minimum wastage and making sure it's really effective. And generally, I would say uh, the stronger the brand, usually they do spend more on sort of marketing and seeing its importance. Sometimes it's all about budget for marketing. A lot of time and resources are taken up um, with sort of creating great content, those creative ideas, um, even if budgets are tight. If you've got um, great ideas on execution, so worked with different providers, we've painted <laughs> bikes and put them in the local area. Other providers, we've really worked on signage outside and found that's made a huge difference. Um, you can come up with much more guerrilla creative marketing ideas. It isn't sometimes always about the budgets. But um, what I tend to find is it's looking at budgets as a percentage um, of revenue is crucial. Also comparing it on how much if you're bringing in leads, one of the justifications of marketing is looking at the cost of what you would pay a broker for that lead. So that's a great tool that often um, use to justify the marketing budgets to say we need sort of 10% there because you would pay a broker 10% to fill the place. Um, how we would sort of develop it is into some buckets. And one that's always core is that top line brand awareness. And I would say this is about creating compelling content. So there's always a sort of content sort of, um, with this sort of put 25 different buckets here. Uh, sorry, 
four different buckets are about 25% of time allocation. Sort of, I would look at a sort of the marketing plan allocating to each. So one is focused on really great content, core baseline content. The other, because of this provider being much more a neighborhood workspace, um, the local awareness ecosystem is crucial. So the, the activities there of media partnerships, PR locally, uh, local business networks, and we put 25% of effort and focus into the local ecosystems, really with that awareness objective. What you're seeing here is a traditional sales funnel. Um, so your reach is going to be bigger with the awareness, but then you're trying to filter people down to convert them. To convert people, we need they need to start discovering and learning about yourself. So this is where targeted communications are really strong. And sometimes it's neglected because it's that overlap between sales and marketing. But to bring organic leads yourself, um, and if you've done lots of marketing activities, paid for adverts and everything, you want to be capturing those people's data and then targeting them. So that's where targeted communications is crucial for the final bit is really focusing on conversions and efforts need to call them calls to action. You need to really think about these trigger points of a tour. How are you going to convert people? That is a key part of the marketing. So um, the marketing plan here is really about you know, um, being very targeted and commercially driven about how you spend your time and how you're converting people. What we do with sort of KPIs with, with each of these sort of four buckets here, we put KPIs around each of these in the sales funnel of activities to sort of link it with the marketing plan always. Spaces to Places have worked with a variety of different providers, all different sizes as well. So we bring you know, I think the enjoyment I get of going to different workspaces and seeing how to bring them to life and with their USPs is crucial. Um, one thing I would recommend is always to go out and you know venture out to a new area, see a new workspace, because I think it will give you, now we can sort of much more be able to go different places, it will energise you by seeing different workspaces and how they market as well, because you work out where your strengths are and how then to crystallize your own offering. So we've got so many new providers um, coming up with new propositions. And like I said, post COVID now, it, the customer service element, the whole experience element is really increased. So being aware of other providers and competition is crucial. Just going finally into sort of top tips uh, that we found in the last two years working really well is being personable. Uh, especially on LinkedIn, uh, personal profiles of reaching way more people or direct responses from a person. So um, people respond to people and businesses. Sometimes um, this might be bringing the founder's story out much more. So personal branding, a key one. The other one with branding is consistency. I think it's not, we're creating a whole marketing plan. Well, the great thing is, crucial that you think about content um, not just for short term so social media quickly but your whole bank of content that you can use and at first impressions there I come on to here as well hero images and copy with that first impression with the consistency and everything it gives you credibility and statistics are saying you can earn 25 percent sort of more um, if your brand is consistent that people are willing to sp uh, spend because they see you as quality. So always thinking that um, by being consistent, you're getting a higher revenue as well. Websites now, we're seeing much more the move to performance marketing and we're working a lot more on goal conversion tracking for return on investment, especially uh, now with PPC, you can see those user journeys much more. So websites getting much more tighter on the purpose about being lead generation and directing um, right through the website that journey to get people to inquire and actually get their data as mentioned before google my business is really strong um, so working with google and posting and getting reviews added is going to stand you in good stead most providers are finding more people hitting google my business than their website so that's why it's important there the other one I mentioned was targeting and database marketing, sometimes often forgotten sort of part of the marketing mix, but it 
reaps the benefits of you're continuously building those relationships and use you know knowing who your targets are of local businesses locally is crucial to build those relationships thank you so much i know that i've been talking at speed for you for about 20 minutes there and everything and i'm sure you've got questions thank you very much for your time there okay thank you sorry um now we've we lost Zoe a few times with some slight <laughs> signal drop-offs, but I think we didn't lose any of the content. There was a, an awful lot packed in there, um, and hopefully we can we can hold on for some questions. Um, it's all <laughs> the perils of, of online, but I think it, it, it's it's been okay. So we will. Um, so just a reminder: if anyone has any more questions, just to put those in the chat box. But I've got a few that were submitted when when people registered. Um, so firstly, um, how do you create more direct leads for office space or will there always be a reliance on brokers? I think you've, you've covered obviously a huge amount in that for the first bit of the question by the broker aspects. Um, interesting. So it might, might, might be something that you'd like, you'd like to address. I think with the dynamics of the broker industry, um, it's much more dominated London and Manchester, Birmingham core cities. That's where most of the brokers um activities are focused and there you'll get the most leads. If you come outside into more rural areas, you'll find you've got less dominance of brokers and you have greater strength to build build a strong brand. If you look at Platform 9 in Brighton and stuff, they have a really strong brand that's known locally and will get leads directly there. Um, so that's the really strength because they have invested into that brand as well. Got client waiting house, Basingstoke, 95% of their leads are direct because working on sort of regular email marketing, uh, websites being optimized, uh, doing PPC and looking at conversions there. So it is possible to reduce your reliance always on brokers. And what we've done quite a lot with uh, quite a few clients is making sure to know all the businesses locally because there's nothing worse than a lead coming to you from somebody down the road that you should have known already. I think that's the one where you want to reduce that reliance on brokers on having your close network of local businesses already. That's the big difference there and where you can reduce that reliance on paying broker fees. But brokers have a role to play, especially if they're bringing somebody outside an area um, into your area, then that is just, you know, their, their fees and what they're doing in their work and justifying and selling yourself in as an area and as a location um, that is worthwhile. And that's where I think it's always that balance. They will always work on much more short term and commission, whereas marketing is much more about that pipeline and long term. So there is some differences in the roles there. Yeah, so the, the two definitely complement each other as strategies mm. to be to be taking to to increase customers. Um, just to maybe pick up the question that's just come in, what, what's your target return on investment, please? There's been a, a question just tab tabled. <laughs> yes, yeah, so with the return on investment, what I'm looking at is we have a spreadsheet of all the different channels and all the marketing activities. So each of those will have a performance on the percentage, well, first of all, how much reach, the percentage conversion rates as well. And then we always put a model around 6% going, yeah, everybody needs six, six touch points before they convert. So that's when you put sort of modeling tools in there. With return on investment, it's easier. So is with PPC advertising and showing, uh, so quite a few easy ones that we can demonstrate is by spending money on PPC that it's leading to meeting room bookings and bringing people from outside an area for meeting room bookings. That's an obvious one that can show by spending 200 pounds a month, it's bringing in revenue of sort of 600 pounds a month from PPC. So that one's easier equations because the bigger sort of whole marketing campaigns and what we're doing is we're looking at return on investment on all those leads, but not attributing it to just a lead attributing say it came from the website it's not only the website there's many more channels that will help to support that into conversion so we have some models there to show sort of with the 10 percent sort of fee um that a broker would pay to a marketing um budget there so directly comparing 
Okay, thank you. Uh, in, interesting me mentioning meeting rooms. That seems to be a, a real boom area over the last few months. We've been hearing that a lot from our, our members of, of interest in meeting rooms. Perhaps the change of people's working arrangements means they're wanting to bring staff together or, or people. So that seems to have been um, UK wide a, a consistent area. So going back to um, pre submitted questions. Um, what are the key factors in determining if a market is right for establishing a flexible workspace product? So Hillary and the team here at Space Places comes from a background of retail planning. So working for large supermarkets and working out where you're going to position a supermarket, what's the demand, um, what's the local demographics, what's the population. So exactly the same, those models that are used in the hotel industry you can determine the success factors of a location um, the same way. So what we do with any clients looking for sort of expansion opportunities is look at um, worker population, how many the population is there, the workers already, what type of businesses already exists, what's the competition, what's their price point. So we have a sort of, you know, is it near a town centre, what's the vibrancy, is it near a university? So quite, quite a model scorecard. And then as like with different retailers, um, there'll be different criteria that are crucial for those success factors as well. So um, how do you determine a successful location? I think the simple basics would always be making sure there is an existing worker population is quite a crucial one. Regis will only open if there's 30,000 worker population. I think if you're looking at sort of quick fixes, but there is much more into the models on expansion planning and where to go and what size. I think the other one is determining locations also, what size office and what type of office provision that also needs to come into the mix as well with locational planning. And with the expansion of flexible workspace, there's just there's so many different types of places, size of places that it's finding a home in, isn't it? It's um, it's just yeah, a, a lot, lots of different options now. Um, so um, the final pre-submitted question: um, How can single site and small SME flexible workspace operators, often with the tiniest of marketing budgets, promote their products and services competitively against bigger and better funded operators. Now, you, you've obviously touched on that in your presentation, but is there anything that you particularly draw out as being your real recommendation to the to the smallest flexible workspace operators? I think it's thinking about those dynamics of the, the restaurant industry, there is always gonna be a Pizza Express, a Frankie and Benny's and larger providers. And so they have, the marketing spend but they're spending in a whole portfolio we, you can always find great restaurants locally that have a niche and a usp that stands out and then it's very much tailored they're much more connected with the local community um they've got great passionate people and businesses behind um, businesses located there as well so always don't look, always look at the sort of what bigger companies are sometimes doing and sort of more their grander reach it's very much um, with sort of more local independent workspaces focusing on what you do great and standing out for that and thinking about what brings that to life uh, and the partnerships is a great one you know what can you do better than a bigger provider you know how can you do bring people together how do you sort of influence much more with the local council and partnerships there um, can you work with the economics of, um, sort of department and bring sort of synergies? Because sometimes they open up, uh, quite a few clients open up funding. I think that's the other one um, that's always crucial. So really thinking about where's the synergies, contra deals as well, and that your USP, I think, if you're targeting a niche, if you're targeting a price point or anything, thinking about how you can shine, that's when it's less about marketing budget, but it's much more that strategic creative piece that is going to, you know, make sure you shine. OK, thank you. And then perhaps just as a, as a final one. Um, so you touched on the various social media platforms that people could use. If if someone isn't using any at the moment and it, yeah, that's obviously a potentially a free way of, of doing some marketing. What would be your your tip on something to just sort of first, you know, putting your toe in the water to, see, to, to have a go at it? I always say 
Mm, yeah, you should dip your toe in. I think it's sort of social media is jumping in and getting it, getting involved because then you can learn and progress and work out the algorithms and how they work. Social media is about doing it for the long term. I see lots of sometimes campaigns and people get super excited, set up Twitter accounts, all different ones and stuff, and then don't maintain it. So I will always maintain and actually say allocating some time to that. The LinkedIn is a great channel to start off if you've got a centre manager locally a local center manager and reaching out to businesses locally that's a great tool but only if you've got a strong individual person because company profiles don't work on linkedin uh, so well you're not going to get the attraction the other one is instagram is it will take you a while with both of these to build it up i think that's the one where if you're starting with no budget as well and you're starting for zero consistency is the key i think that you can't, you know, consistently keep on building your network, building of the local businesses that you already occupy as then the businesses in the area. Um, that's the one where suddenly people look at others and go, oh, look, they've got millions of followers and stuff and get really scared. It's OK because you're focusing on local quality and, and building it slowly and gradually as opposed to putting loads of money behind it. So I think that's the one. Start doing it. But have your expectations that you're not suddenly going to get millions of followers. Okay, I think that's the one where um, just to manage expectations and keep getting. It's always the way we're keeping going with marketing activities with consistency. If you're not seeing those results, sometimes it's really easy to give up. And it is the persistency of that work that's crucial with social media. Yeah, so planning ahead and thinking, well, this is what we're doing now, but this is what we're going to do next week or next next month. Um, and certainly for our sort of central position at the Flexible Space Association, we we definitely see a lot of um, LinkedIn engagement um, from our from our members. And and as you say, often with centre managers running accounts, and um, which yeah is is seem, seems to work really well. And I, it, for for a lot of a lot of companies, so. and it's because it's the be you know it's much more professional business orientated networks. So hence you get the quality. And if you try with advertising, you will spend more um, on advertising on LinkedIn because you do have the quality. The quality people are there to be, and you can directly reach out to them as well. So that's one of the key things there. Yeah. OK, well, thank you very much, Zoe. That was an awful lot of information packed in and hopefully really, really useful for everybody. Um, and, and we will um, put this onto our YouTube channel if anyone wants to, to catch up on and any of the content again. Um, our, our next um, Workspace Wisdom webinar is um, at the same time, 11 a.m. on Thursday, the 3rd of March. And that's going to be on the topic of how to take great pictures of flexible workspaces, which I think kind of complements the, the presentations we've had this morning. Um, and that's going to be given by Marek Sakura, who is a um, professional commercial photographer He's the author of a book, Commercial Interior Photography Guidelines. So I think that's going to be a, a really worthwhile um, webinar. Um, and um, registration details are on the events page of our website. It's open at the moment to Flexible Space Association members. And then if there are spaces available, we'll open it up at a little nearer the time. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you to, um, to Zoe. Um, you can find um, lots more information about Spaces to Places on their website and also on our website as they're, they're one of our service provider members. Um, so um, thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Goodbye. Thank you very much. And do reach out if you've got questions. So take care. Thanks, Zoe. Bye. Bye.